Good evening, church family, and welcome to our Friday night moments with Pastor David and Marie. And again, it's always great to have Pastor and Marie with us. And I uh, just want to say hello, you guys. Hi, John. How you guys? <laughs> hello, John. <laughs> How you guys doing? We're good. Good, good. good. Pastor, uh, before we get started, I wanted to see if you can give the church any updates so far on what's been transpiring. Just a brief update to... Uh, about what? About... The plans of possibly down the road, what it's looking like as other churches are preparing to open. Uh, we've been having things on uh, Sunday after, during second service, and just any updates you'd like to share with the church. Well, basically, one is, is we have des you know desperately missed the church, if you will, and so um, Marie and I, as well as you and others, have been coming to the. Uh, to the church grounds on Sunday just to, to be here. And then recently I I let people know that we were here. So in the event that they wanted to drive by to say hi, that we'd be able to visit with them. And that's been taking place for the last couple of weeks. And we've been real blessed to be able to see um, many of the members of our church. So from there, I have come to realize that we really need to make some decisions about once again, meeting not just online, which I, I am so blessed that, <laughs> I really am so blessed that God has used our online um, services in a real beautiful way. We we're able to reach any from our fellowship who want to uh, you know, be with us online, and, and apparently uh, quite a number do. And uh, that's been a blessing. And going to seven-day-a-week uh, teachings, you know, uh, you know, Sunday through through Saturday, multiple times, sometimes during during the week as well as on the weekend has been a blessing. We're able to put a variety of studies on. And again, this is really in particular for members of, of our, our, our fellowship. But I, I welcome any who have a desire to to uh, to join us, of course, throughout the the nation and and, and into the world. So from that, we've been really, really blessed. But I really want to spend time with our fellowship, and I feel uh, a sense of the Spirit. It's not my emotional kind of thing, because I've tried to let my emotions be under the um, guidance of the Holy Spirit. But I, I sense that it's it's nearing the time for us to to once again gather on the church grounds and to have live Bible studies, live church services. And so at the moment, we are looking to uh, all the guidelines that you get from, um, you know, the government scientific community and all to see how we can um, follow those guidelines to have um, church services that are, that are safe for our members of our church I've said this a number of times, John, you've heard me in private conversation, but I've made this open and open statement. I, I feel that if there's any, any organization that was, that is capable of taking care of people, following proper procedures to ensure to the best of our ability their safety, it has to be the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no way that uh, that a, a you know a, a, a giant store or um, you know gymnasium or whatever. There's no way that they're going to match us when it comes to caring about the people who come and are within the confines of of our building. There's just no way because we have been created by God to love one another. Mm -hmm. Whereas going to Costco doesn't mean I have to love the person next to me. As a matter of fact. We've seen fights in the aisles with those who are in Costco. <laughs> That's right. Right? And so we've only had two or three of those in church. <laughs> and that was with my elders and we had to deal with it. But we uh, we don't have that problem because we are sincerely caring for people. And so we're putting together a plan right now. And um, and hopefully very soon, within a, within a short time, three, four weeks or so, I won't, I won't give a date yet. We anticipate uh, meeting here again for uh, live services. Now, I was asked if I was part of the coalition of churches that um, are going to be opening up on May 31st. And my answer I just gave to somebody who just asked me 
uh, is that I'm not following the directives of of uh, anybody, not because I'm better than them or superior to them. Uh, that's not why. It's that I think that sometimes people act out of different interests than we do. And so I, I do know that we want to get together. I do know that we we are going to get together, but it will be when when we sense here that that's the right time for Calvary Chapel Chino Valley to once again have services on campus. And so, no, I'm not part of this coalition of churches. You know, there are numbers that are being kind of thrown out, which I've never been impressed with people's exaggerated numbers. Oh, 3,500 or 550, those are numbers I'm hearing. People like to use numbers to create an invisible army behind them. And uh, I've been around long enough to know that sometimes you just use numbers to try and, and make an impact. And and I can tell you this, I don't want to send any kind of message to Governor Newsom other than the message of the gospel. Amen. You know, I, I don't. I, I'm not going to pick a fight with, uh, with our governor, even though I disagree vehemently. I'm not going to pick a fight with the guy for no reason other than because I may be pugnacious, belligerent, or frustrated. I just don't do that. Now, others can do that if they want the answer to God for it. I think they violate Scripture when they take that, that position. That's how I read Scripture. But with that said, I'm not going to do it for that reason. The reason I will gather together it, with my church is because I'm a shepherd. I desire to minister to our people. Our people need each other. Um, the part of the heart of our ministry is uh, the heart of fellowship, the withness of our pillars, and um, the other pillars. We need to get into the Word. We need to worship. But at the same time, we will continue broadcasting online because I want to respect the concerns and very valid reasons why people may not be ready to or able to come. Um, and And I respect that very much. And so... We'll see what happens, John, but I'll, I'll be releasing uh, the date. And again, this is for those who are part of our church who who want to be here with us. And, and I'm grateful that there are people who don't go to our fellowship who join us on our programs, and, and I hope they continue. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I expect that we'll be opening up the doors uh, to our campus fairly soon. It's going to be an exciting time. I It'll be, uh, it, it, well, you know, I don't, yeah, I guess. I, I Yeah, John, um, at, I'm, it's hard for me to say what I'll feel about that, whether it'll be exciting or not, frankly. I I just think it's about time. Yes. You know, yeah. it's more of an about time. And some people will be excited and others will come in wearing two or three masks. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll see. You know, our topic today is... Uh, as we now switch gears, is communication and marriage. You know, I, there's a high percentage of, of couples that come in that I meet with for biblical guidance. The core issue always seems to be centered around communication uh, and or lack of. And so how do you see communicate? And I mean, this is probably a question that anybody can answer in terms of, of course, communication is important. How do you both maintain that communication even throughout the years that continue a healthy marriage? You know, when I was in college many years ago now, um, one of my classes, actually I took several, several courses related to marriage, marriage and the family. That was my interest because I wanted to learn from a seasoned kind of um, "Quote unquote professional," somebody who, who taught such courses, I wanted to learn from them anything that they had learned, that could help me be a good husband because I knew that without help I wouldn't be one, and and I believe very strongly that as a Christian I still need to, to grow in my understanding and knowledge. Just because I'm saved doesn't make me automatically a good Christian. I have to pursue the Lord and things of that nature, and so. From the beginning, I began to look into classes in, in, in college courses that related to, to that subject. And so uh, something I remember from way back then is that 
uh, at that time, the professors were emphasizing three aspects, you know, that you needed to to learn to do well in. Uh, they said these are the three troubled areas, trouble areas that you find in, 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 in uh, marriages. One is uh, sexual intimacy, two, uh, financial problems, and three, communication. Those are the three basic things, you know, learning what it means to have an, an intimacy that has, has a physicality to it and learning to budget and, and, and the things that pertain to your money and then learning how to communicate. And out of those three, uh, I would probably put communication at the top of the list because in the communication, learning to communicate hearts and all of that to one another is going to bleed over. I would say into how you budget and and how you are intimate. I would say that that all blends together. And so, communication, as I learned, and as Marie and I, and I'm sure that Marie would agree with this, um, because she agrees with everything I say, <laughs> because I'm such a clear communicator. I, I think that uh, we would agree that communication isn't just words. You know, I read my wife. I read her like I read a book. I I I, I believe that communication is not just words, but it's it's the things that pertain to the words. It's the way those words are said. It's the volume. It's the tone. It's it's the face. It's the body posture. It's all of that is communication. You know, um, we don't read our, our wives like we read words on a piece of paper. We read our, our wives by listening to her, by knowing the events that are transpiring prior to what she's saying. And all of that, and that takes study. It takes a lot of effort. It really does. You have to really learn to hear the word and the meaning. And plus, you have to learn what the um, what that word uh, is to be interpreted as. It, it, it's very complicated, and yet it's not. It is complicated when you don't make an effort. It's not so complicated when you learn quickly and you say, oh, and she says, you're not wearing that. Well, that's another way of saying don't wear that, you know, or are you ready to leave is another way of saying, how come you're late? You know, things like that. So you learn their language patterns. It's like I was raised learning, you know, to, to, to communicate in English, and my wife was, was raised, and she speaks in French, you know, and so I had to learn her language, and the only way to learn her language, and I am still learning her language, because, you know, though she and I don't have fights, you know, like, like when you're young and, oh, I'm going to do it and you're going to do it my way. We don't do that anymore. We had enough of those to have laid a foundation to know where this is going to go <laughs> if you keep going in this direction. So that's how we avoid the fights is that we know what leads to them, right? And how did that happen? It happened because she has done her best to figure me out. You know, when I say something she's learning my language and i've tried to learn hers you know and again there's i don't know a real expert in this world you know who can really understand because one of the things about human beings is we change you know we you know i was a behavioral science major that's what i was and the very first day of class that i had in one of my classes the professor said it's a misnomer to call it behavioral science he says, because human beings change. He said, science speaks concerning those things that don't change. And that's how you make your your laws and all. He said, but human beings change. He said, somebody can do something for two or three or 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then one day they decide to do something different. He said, so we don't call it science in, in the purest sense of the word. And that's true. Mm -hmm. So the longer I'm with Marie and the more she's evolving as a woman, and the more I'm growing as a man, we are constantly learning different and new patterns. But we have the foundation, I would say, of what initially we came to learn were the basic or the rudiments of, of, of what it meant to say, this is how I feel and this is what I want. So I'm very verbal, you, you know, I'm very verbal. I, am, I, I told Marie when we got married, I said, I don't read minds. I can't, I'm not even going to try. Um, you have to be clear with me so I know that I'm, I'm pleasing you. You have to. And I don't have a problem with you saying what's on your mind. I don't. 
let me know. It's a lot easier for you to say, I don't like this or I don't want to go there than for me to think you like it and then to take you where you don't want to go. Because my, my desire is to, to have a good time with you. And if you don't want to be there, you're going to let me know by the minute I get there that you didn't want to be here. So please tell me before we go. See, so that's kind of how we were, right? And we yeah, still are. Yeah, true. Yeah, it is. You know, you're mentioning, Pastor, when... Uh, <laughs> Would you like to add to that, Marie? Well, well, I'll give you an example. Early on, um, we had uh, in our relationship, um, um, I was living in a, 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 with a couple of I had roommates, uh, two roommates, and David asked me to go to the you know to the movies to see something, and I invited them without speaking to him. And uh, I, I just thought, hey, the, I, was, I'm, I was the type, the more the merrier. That was me. The more the more the merrier, come on, let's all go. Well, that didn't go over very well with him at all. And I was, I was so surprised because I, what do you have to say to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, took, I, I said to her, because she invites her roommates. And, and, and so they said, oh, we'd love to go. And so... They went to get ready, and I said, Maria, I need to go to my car for a minute. Would you come with me? And she said, sure, of course. And we go to my car, and I turned around, and I said, um, I really would appreciate it if you would let me know before you invite your friends. It's not that I don't like them. I think they're great. I didn't drive 45 minutes to be with them, though. I came 45 minutes to be with you. And so you need to let me know that you're going to do that because I don't like change. Do I like change? No, not at all. <laughs> I still don't like change. I'm learning that. <laughs> yeah, I know you are. <laughs> so, yeah, that's part of what we, that's, we, we do what we do. Um, and the other person learns from it. And just, Marie never did that again. And it's not because I didn't like her roommates. I did. They were part right. of my Bible study. It's just that I liked her more. And for me, it was a sacrifice. And as a man, I know that women are different today, but as a man, I felt obligated to pay their way into a movie or any drinks they may want or popcorn. I felt obligated to take all three of them out. And I, I was a student at that time. I didn't have any money. And the little that I did, I would spend on her. And so she was adding to my expenses. So there were things yes. involved that she wasn't aware of. My girl here is a very, very friendly, friendly person, as you know, John. And, uh, and that's why I love her. But it only would work if she were to clue me in on what she's about to do, and which she learned immediately. Yes. And she, so she'd say, do you mind if or would you like to? And that's all that we really needed to do. So I could say, well, you know, yeah, that'd be fine. Or not, not really, honey, because I came to see you. And we learned that. And mm -hmm. that's how you do it, right? I mean, that's how you and your wife learned is you just, you make your mistakes. You step over certain invisible lines. Which I don't, but it's okay. Oh, of course you don't. You live on the, <laughs> you live on the edge, John. You're a wild kind of guy. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yes, that's what exactly. happens is you, you make your mistakes. And you discover very early, we don't think the same way. And it's not that one's right and one's wrong. You just have to make a decision that what is right and wrong is what is best for us. And if it's best for us and we keep the peace, this is good. And so it's we've been working at that for a long time. And um, that doesn't mean that we're, we're experts at it, because we're not. Mm -hmm. But we're much better than we've ever been. And, and me, again, you know, I, I am real open with what I feel. I, I figure, with my girl, I, I figure that she needs to know the guy she's married to. And, and so I'm real open with her. I'll tell her, this is how I feel. This is what I want. If she doesn't want that, she can tell me. She can say, well, I, I don't see that. And that's communication. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't? Okay, I'm probably wrong, which most of the time I am. I have to be real about that. My wife has got such a, a sweet, pure heart that I'm very, very attuned to it because I can be wrong. And that's no, no real admission. It's just a fact. I, 
I can be wrong. I, I can be thinking something that's not true at all. So I'm, I, I found it better to ask or to say and say, can you explain to me? Because this is what I'm seeing. And, and I'll tell you, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not right about this, but please let me know so I don't make mistakes and then we end up upset at each other for no reason. So that's been part of us, I'd say, pretty much all, all these years. Yeah, I would say the same thing, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, communication is like a dance. It mm -hmm. is a dance. Each other. The Watusi. The Watusi. Yes. <laughs> and the mashed potato. I don't think the so. The alley -oop. The <laughs> alley -oop. Now, now, that I disagree with both of you. <laughs> what is it? The cha-cha-cha? <laughs> yes. No. But, you know, you think about even what you're explaining right now, the uh, the give and take in communication, the learning. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a, a two-step dance where you're learning the move of one another, mm -hmm. but it, it, through expression. You know, Pastor, you mentioned something a few moments ago about uh, taking the time to study Marie. What would you say to those, for those people, especially the men who maybe have been married for a while or, or some of the men that, because uh, one of the things I had to do was uh, in marriage, I realized how selfish I am. There's things that I like that I, it didn't matter what my wife liked. Or, and I'm learning that, you know, it's not about me. In the communication, when you're learning your significant other, and your, your selfishness has blinded you a little to wanting to to know your wife and study your wife, or I just don't feel like doing that. It's be, how would you address that person? You know, when Marie and I began to date, I was um, I was actually older than my friends who had gotten married. Many of my friends had gotten married at 21, 22. And I was 24 when I met Marie. I just just had turned 24. And so I, I was actually the old guy amongst my friends um, comparatively when it came to getting married and all. But for me, you know, having... Um, I never had lots of dates. I wasn't one of those guys that, that had to go out and had to have girlfriends. You know, if I had a girlfriend, it would be on and off again for some time. And so I had gotten in the military, got out of the army, was going to college, was not dating, had asked God to allow me to go to sleep to my desires. And then he brought Marie, and then I felt the sense of freedom to, to take her out and all. And, and all of that goes into how I learned to communicate. And, I, and this is how it began, is I, I, the guys in my generation, and maybe still true, I don't know, maybe they're a young men still doing this we were we were not real and many of us were not, many of us especially me were not real i was that guy who if i asked a young woman out i'd i'd try and study her and figure out what she liked by asking i'd say what do you think about this do you like this kind of and and so i'm trying to figure her out and then i would say, oh yeah i like that too when in fact sometimes i didn't <laughs> you know i i didn't i just wanted to charm her or make her like me, and I thought that if I agreed with whatever she said, you know, that uh, is a good chance that that she might give me a, a, a second date or whatever. That's how I was. But I had gotten tired of it. By the time I met Marie, I, I wasn't dating anybody, but by the time I met Marie, I had come to the place where I said, I don't want her dating or going out with somebody that's not real that she will later on discover once you know we're into the relationship because she's gonna she would fall for the wrong guy because i'm just pretending to like this and i'm pretending to like that so you know as selfish speaking of selfish as this may seem i felt i wanted to be authentic i wanted to be real so i would say marie i'm gonna go to this place would you like to go with me maria i'd like to eat this food so i wouldn't say where do you want to eat or where do you want to go i never did that not in the beginning I'd say, I, I want to go out, and I'm going to go here. Because it wasn't because of the selfishness on my part. It was more, I wanted her to know I liked these things. And if she liked the guy who liked this kind of food and this kind of music and, and go to these kinds of places, we'd get along. Because I don't have to change. I don't have to be different. I don't have to figure out what she likes and then do that when, in fact, I don't like it. That's how it was. 
And so she, she grew to like the real person, the real me. And I liked her, you know, and for, and she was real cause she liked to eat at the same places. So she liked the same kinds of movies and she liked the same music and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So that's how I did it. So we, we began, um, our relationship by just being real, by just being real, no longer acting like, oh, I like that food when I don't, or I like that music when I don't, or mm -hmm. I like these things when I don't, because that's going to come out once the ring's on her yeah. finger and we're married. <laughs> and she says, ah, you always liked it. No, I didn't. I just went because you did. And that's a, that's a, that's what guys, they, they do fight over stuff like that. I only went because you wanted to go. I never liked it. You never asked me that kind of thing. Uh, I didn't, we don't play that. I, I, I chose not to do that. And so I figured I wanted this girl to know the real person. And, um, and she, you know, lo and behold, she, she did. She liked me. So I didn't have to change. I didn't have to. Not, not to try and win her. I had to change to keep her. You know, and that isn't by the foods, and that isn't by the music, and that's not by the movies. It's you no, know, is as a person that should should deserve her love, as a person that that um, that should should deserve her respect, you know, and her affection. Uh, I, I changed into that guy because once she cared about me, and I really came to believe she did, because it took a long time. For me to believe she really cared for me you know i came from a background where that just wasn't part of what i thought anybody would ever care for me and so it took a long time for her to actually and she didn't work at it she didn't have to i had to come to the point of saying she does care for me i just didn't think she did but that was me i thought nobody did so for her she did and but she liked the real guy and what she liked like the the real person um, I wanted to be a better person. So that means I need to now be really interested in, in what makes her happy, what, what makes her fulfilled, you know? I think when, when Paul, uh, says to husbands are to, to, uh, to, um, love their wives as Christ loved the church, or when Peter said, uh, husbands are to dwell with their wives with understanding, uh, I, I have come to understand that, that that means having a sacrificial heart and uh, and an interested an interest, a true interest in in that person, you know. And when you start combining those things, you die to yourself because men, a lot of guys I know, John, and you have met them too, think that leading the home is being a bully or you know, being a leader is is uh, making her do what you want and seeing things your way. And to me, that's one of the biggest mistakes that a man ever makes. You know, I really do believe in in cherishing my wife. You know, I I'm not always good at it, and 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 I don't want to pretend that I am. I'm not. I'm I'm any I'm a man like every other man. I I still learn how how to talk and how to not hurt her by my directness or whatever, that's that's something I have to learn still. But um, I'm not the same guy I used to be because I've put on many years of, of learning her uh, and how can I be a good husband. If you love someone, don't you lay your life down for them? Well, what happens when you lay your, your life down for your wife? You know, she loves you even more. And I've discovered that. And she's spoiled. And I've told my kids, yeah, she's spoiled. And I said, that's my job. Um, it's my job to spoil her. I can spoil her. She's my wife. I'm supposed to spoil her. But she, on the other hand, John, she's supposed to res respect me so she doesn't take advantage of me. Because I can take her, and we don't have children living at home anymore. And, mm -hmm. and the finances I used to use to buy the kids their food and their clothing and and uh, all of that that you're spending now for your babies, <laughs> yes. you know? Um, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to buy a lot more food and all, I don't. So I've got spending money, so it's kind of nice, you know? So, but I can take Marie and I do have, and she knows she handles the finances, she knows what we have. 
when she and I can go someplace and 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 I if I see that she likes something, I can say, baby, do you want that? Because I know we can afford it. I guarantee you 90%, 90, 95 or more percent of the time, she'll say no. So I've never, I don't have a woman who's spending money and making me bankrupt. I don't have that. Uh, that's why it's a lot easier to to even be more generous, not because uh, I know she won't you know, want to buy it, therefore uh, I'll just say it. <laughs> no, I don't do that either. But because... She knows how hard I work, and she knows, she knows what it means to be a steward of God's finances. And she lives a very simple life. She doesn't. She she really doesn't. I'm bragging about her as if she's not here, but no, it's true. Uh, anything she wants, I will do anything I can to get if if it's within within responsible activity, you know. But she doesn't ask, and it makes it even easier for me. And I know that's unique. I know that's unique. I don't have to prove to her I love her by buying things for her. And she she doesn't force me to. So I'm free. I'm free to do it. And there are a lot of, lot of things like that in our marriage that um, makes our relationship our relationship. It's very unique. And I don't know that another woman is like Marie in this. I don't. I don't want to ever find out. Mm-hmm. You know, but I can tell you. Well, you better not. <laughs> well, I won't tell you because I don't want to hurt you because I don't want to communicate about my other girlfriend. <laughs> I'll get it. <laughs> you know, the communication, uh, there can be this pseudo communication that we we're just, you're just explaining about in early marriage, even in some marriages now that people can have. I remember with my wife as we were engaged uh, she'd come over uh, my parents house we'd have dinner or lunch after Mm -hmm. church and it'd be like the time like it's fourth down the team's like down you know four points there's a minute left on the clock for a football game and it seemed like at that time my wife wanted my fiance at the time wanted to have a conversation Mm -hmm. (laughs) so the good fiance Mm -hmm. that i was would turn to her and we would chit chat about what she wanted to chit chat and, uh, mm-hmm. and I really caught myself after we got married and after the ring was on her finger, mm-hmm. no longer did I, did I really have to turn now and, mm-hmm. and I can still have one ear to the TV and one eye to the TV and one ear and one eye to her. But there seems like there's this, uh, there can be this sense of pseudo communication when you're trying to win the woman over, you know, and, and versus what it's really like now, you know? And so I've been mindful of that to be nothing's changed it needs to be the same if anything it needs to evolve more mm-hmm. you know and so uh I, i'm learning that as as we go you know one of the things pastor and marie if you'd like to share on this as well uh you know there's this uh this thought out there that there is communication within a christian marriage versus communication within a marriage personally i don't see a difference except the, the Christian marriage has a foundation of Christ. I think there's a lot of things out there that people are looking to for self-help mm. in, in Christian marriages. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about this Christian marriage versus a non-Christian marriage, but yet it seems like communication is across the board regardless. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, think, I think that in general... Christians speak a language called Christianese. We we like our terminology to be couched in in a scripture or a biblical principle in order for us to be comfortable with at least hearing it. But I also know that many people who are fluent in Christianese don't understand what the words mean because they don't do the things that they say they believe, right? And so communication in its rawest form is simply... Uh, two hearts that are are able to comprehend one another, whether it be through, like I said, through the expression in a physical way or whether it be an expression through a verbal way. It, 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 there are sim- similar and basic principles, I would assume, that, that are in general just true to communicate. See, so, so I think that sometimes people hide behind the veneer of what is Christian and not to continue doing what they want to do. And so if the wife says, 
well, I know that I'm supposed to respect him, but he's not respectable. Therefore, till mm -hmm. he becomes respectable, I will not respect him, right? Or the guy says, well, she doesn't submit. If she submitted, then, you know, then the Bible say, see, so I think that we use the Bible sometimes as a, as a hammer, uh, a weapon of some sort to be able to maintain um, our own lives and do what we want to do and, and still call it Christian. And so, you know, anybody who speaks to me um, about anything that they're going through, they're going to get a biblical answer. If not with an actual verse, they will get a, a biblical answer with a principle that you'll find in Scripture that I can back with Scripture, right? And so uh, that's just general, again, that's general conversation. I, I'm not always quoting Scripture to you. You and I talk quite a bit, right? But when we talk, we're just flowing. There's... And then you'll hear me say, well, you know, that's where, or you'll say, where did you see? And we'll talk about the scripture that became that foundation, that the reason why I said that. And the longer you walk with the Lord, the more immersed you are with, with principles of scripture. With, I was sharing this, for example, just the other day, where, where John in 1 John speaks concerning uh, the command and the word in the same three verses, 1 John chapter 2. And he speaks concerning the command. And I was sharing with, with, the, uh, with my staff uh, how the word, the command that he's using in 1 John 2, 3 through 6, how he was speaking about an actual command you find in the Old or New Testament. And I was sharing how that there are scriptures that are referred to as commands. Jesus speaks about keeping his commands because they were, they were distinct teachings that had biblical verses that were related to him. But he also spoke concerning walking in the spirit of what he was sharing. And that's what John spoke about when he spoke of the word. So there's the command and there's the word. In relationships, you have scripture, you know, so Marie and I will, you know, I, I can quote scripture and she can too. And she can tell me what the Bible says. And sometimes in our, in our conversations, we definitely will do that. But when we're arguing, when we're having a difference of opinion, I don't use the Bible as some kind of uh, a bat or some kind of, right. uh, of a, something that it says. Uh, because to me, and I know that you'd agree with this, oh, it I would do. be a self-righteousness on my part. If I'm not living that already, who am I to be quoting that? I just don't do that. I, I, I just will not do that. I don't do that. She knows what scripture says. Mm -hmm. She's she and I have been in the word together for a long time. She has sat under thousands of Bible studies, John, thousands of them over the years. She's heard me teach as well as, as other teachers for 40 some years now. So now she knows the word and she knows the spirit and flow of the word. So I'm not that guy who's going to say, well, Ephesians 5 says this, or 1 Peter 3 says <laughs> right. that. Now, I did that one time with her, but I was playing when I said, read to me out of 1 Peter. We were driving, she and I, we were dating. Mm -hmm. And I said, read to me out of 1 Peter chapter, chapter, she says, well, where? It's chapter 3. So she starts reading, and, and it gets to the point where Sarah obeyed. Abram calling him Lord and and I stopped her and I said wait what did that say and she says it says Abram uh, that Sarah obeyed and I go oh I like that word <laughs> and then I said and what did she what did she call him and she says Lord I said there you go you know and there are guys who actually do that they actually will look at it, it says she obeyed and called him Lord and you're going to have nothing but a fight mm -hmm. when you when you try and use the scripture as a as a weapon. Uh, you're, you're weaponizing scripture. Uh, I don't do that because Marie knows the flow. She knows, like I said, the command is a specific. The word when John says my the word, he's using the the uh, the inference of scripture, the 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 general flow of what scripture says, the principles of scripture. In the Bible doesn't say specifically, thou shalt not smoke marijuana, right? But it does tell me that be not drunk with wine wherein is dissipation. And what's the whole point of that? Well, the spirit of the scripture is that I lose my control, self-control, 
when I'm allowing something else like wine to influence me. And so I know the inference of Scripture would be, well, I'm not to yield myself to something that causes a lack of control. And marijuana fits that picture, and therefore there's the spirit of the Scripture where God wouldn't say it's okay to smoke pot because because he doesn't. And so that's how you kind of look at it. And so in conversation with, with my girl, we, we will never use, she has never quoted a scripture at me, ever. And I may have in the past, I don't know, I don't want to make myself guiltless, it's been a long time, but I don't think, I, I don't think, John, even as a young Christian mm -hmm. and a young teacher that I've ever quoted scripture to use it as a weapon to, to make her do what I'm saying. No, because if, if, if my love for her is not Bible-based, if my love for her is not, is, is not evidencing a manifestation of God's Spirit in His Word, then it's not real. It's not, it's not the kind she needs. And so that's why the husband needs to, you know, wash the water, with, wash the wife with the water of the Word. He needs to he needs to have a prophetic uh, in chapter five Ephesians five, it speaks concerning that the word that he washes her by, that the, the word it is chosen to be God chose to inspire Paul to use is not the word logos, which is the regular word speaking of the written word and things of like that. It's the word rema. And the word rema there, when the washing of the water of the word, when he's speaking about the the rema, the rema is a, a it's been generalized to be the word for the moment, it, it carries with it a prophetic utterance, which means that that I'm carrying a mantle as a husband of the one who speaks the word of God to the family in a prophetic sense. And how am I going to do that if I don't know God's word? How am I going to be able to say, the Lord has led me to do this, baby, and I really feel we need to. She will not respect me if she doesn't see me living. And if I'm living like what God says, I will have a prophetic mantle when I exercise the word. And that's where the guys make their biggest mistakes is, well, they, they just use the scripture like it's their war tool to get something done. And the wife has every, every understandable reason to say, when you live it, you can give it. And that's where your fights are going to, mm -hmm. you know. And so if the guy is not living as, as the one who gives the rema, gives that word for the moment, that particular word for that instant, it's like like we have in our in, in in our and I don't think I'd be embarrassing my wife to say that in our early early marriage and when we didn't have money mm -hmm. and we didn't have money mm -hmm. and our bills were and she was going through the bills member oh yeah and she was going through the bills at the kitchen table mm -hmm. she's crying mm -hmm. <laughs> and I walked in and I said to her uh, why are you crying mm -hmm. and she said because Honey, we don't have the money to pay our bills. And in my home, I was raised by a father who would not eat until he paid his bills. That's that's how I am as a man to this day. You know, if I will I will not eat, you know, I will pay my bill. And because my name means that much to me. And when she was crying and she knew that we don't have money to pay our bills. And I said to her, I said, My God shall supply all that we need. My God is able. We have to trust him, baby doll. We have to. God will. And I'm trying to encourage her. Mm -hmm. And that's when that check came in the mail. That's right. Oh, and that, that's just one thing, John. There were a lot of other times when God just provided constantly for us, you know, in, way, in amazing ways. You know, when you put your faith and, and trust in him, you know, he, 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 he hears his children, you know, and I can say I've never gone out, gone without anything, you know. Yes, we've had some lean times and st stuff like that, but you know what I have to say? It was a good thing. It really was. It, and, you know, it really was because in, in ways you begin to grow in ways that you didn't even know. You know, I mean, and that was like putting your trust in him because really trust, you know, because sometimes you, we get too comfortable, you know, and um, it's good not to be comfortable, you know. Mm -hmm. God has a way of moving in our lives when we're uncomfortable. 
and it really have to be dependent on him and and i i can i can say um my life's been blessed you know i can say that god has always remained faithful to us and um i i would never want another life Never. I remember on one occasion, following the flow of the conversation, I remember one occasion, because Marie mentioned it's happened more than once, I remember on one occasion at the same table, um, going at the end of the year, we're preparing our taxes. Mm -hmm. and, and I looked at my income of the year, and I looked at our giving, and we hadn't given the, as the proportion that I believed we, sh we should be giving. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember talking to, mm -hmm. to Marie in a kind of a firm way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I said to her, my God has supplied every dime I have. And he, you know, and I... And we will not rob him. Yes. This family will not rob God. He comes first. I was really upset. Yeah. And God and my wife said, "Honey, we can't afford to." And I said, "We can afford we cannot afford not, not to. to. Yeah. We will give God first. Yes. He will take care of us." And he always And he did. Always has. And that was a very important thing for us to it get. Was. That's why she can tell you what she just told you. Yeah. It was. That's why. I, I really learned um, I, I, I learned so much. By being, by giving, by being faithful to God, Him first. We learned a long time ago. We learned a long time ago, John, and this may be veering the conversation in a different direction. Yes. But we learned a long time ago that we can live just as well on nine pennies as we can on ten. Yeah. We learned that a long time ago, and uh, some things we did need, some things we couldn't. Do you know if you you know this, John? You know my kids. David, Aaron, especially fairly well, but you know my kids. And um, they will tell you that there was a time in their life when a McDonald's hamburger was a treat. It was a treat. They never got anything. Uh, one, of the, when, one of the pictures I have that I still, uh, when I see it still brings tears to me, is a picture of my little girl, Corinne, with, who was sitting with her little feet crossed. And I, I'd never noticed that her shoes had holes in them. And she was only three years old. I couldn't afford shoes. I couldn't afford shoes for my babies. I couldn't have food fo afford food for. I couldn't take them out. For them, a vacation was getting up early in the morning and driving when they were still asleep in the back seat and spending one night in a hotel that cost us, you know, less than $30, $40. And I would put Anna, who you know now very well, who's 36 years old, soon to be 37, we would put her in a... Uh, in a chest of drawers that you have inside of the room, we would put a blanket in there and put the baby in there, and she would sleep in a drawer because we couldn't get a, a room that had enough space for four babies. So that's what we did. And they remember that. They remember that. But honoring the Lord and, and, and living for him and finding ways to give them, even if it's an overnight in a hotel and then eating a a hamburger in the morning um, as a treat for breakfast or whatever, we learn to, we learn to trust the Lord in a, a lot of very small things. And if my wife had not been a woman who said, whatever God does with us is what I want, I could have had a wife who complained because I couldn't afford shoes for the kids. I could, I, I used to try and I let my kids' hair grow for a long time. Talk to Dave someday, he'll tell you. And when and I would try try and trim it for him, and I still remember when he was maybe seven or eight years old, how he came up to me, nine years at the most, Daddy, can I get a haircut? Because he, 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 kids were making fun of him. I couldn't afford haircuts, John. I couldn't afford a lot of things. But I could not afford not to be faithful to God. I believe that I still do. I still do. All of that goes into part of the budgeting, you know, part of the tensions yeah. of a home. You put God first and you learn that he will supply my need, not my greed, mm -hmm. not my greed, 
He supplies by need. And my children, they don't, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, when we were poor, and, and, and in a way, John, we were, you know, comparatively, but not desperately. Right. You know, right. we, weren't, we weren't like some of the people I've encountered who really are. But we didn't have very much, very much at all. But you know what? We had each other. We had the Lord. Mm -hmm. We had a roof over our head, and we had blankets on my baby's bodies. And they'll tell you stories of the 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 969 square foot house with four kids, three living in one room, and Anna sleeping in a little bassinet next to us until she was like two years old. They'll 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 tell you those stories, and. Um, but it was all at the end. It was what stretched Marie and me together. It, 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 it made us find that the most basic things were the best things. Mm -hmm. That's why, John, that's why it, Marie and I don't need to go places and do things. We really don't. You know, well, some people are chomping at the bit to get out of their house because of the quarantine. This is to us pretty much normal. <laughs> Seriously, right? I mean, I mean yes. we're always just together anyway. So we, we learned to live simple lives a long time ago. And, uh, and I, I think that's maybe off the course of what our original conversation was. But that all went into who we are, you know, yeah. to, to trust the Lord. It really it did. And I, I think for me, that's just, see, some of those times were the sweetest times in my life because I saw what God did. And I don't regret I mean, I mean, there. I mean, it, it was just a blessing, to, to, you know. Sometimes people have too much, too much junk, you know. And we, we don't need too much stuff. We don't, you know. To, um, we just don't. And some, and but a lot of people feel that way that they they need all this to make them happy. That, that doesn't make you happy. It makes you want more. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, I just felt, thank you, God, you know, thank you for meeting just our, need, our basic needs. That's, that was a blessing. And I'm for, forever grateful for um, not, having, not having stuff. And I came from a family where there were six of us, you know, children, and I was the oldest of six. You know, so, you know, I, I, you know it was very, we always able to eat, God, you know, and... Um, and we were all all good with it, you know. Didn't have a lot of clothes, but we had clothes enough to be clothed and go to school and all that. But I I think sometimes there's an expectation of just desiring more and more and more of things when things will never make you happy. No, you know. They don't. When you trust in the Lord and you've got Him to guide you. Um, um, that's what we need. We need, we, you know, we need to trust in our God. He's a big God, and he's, he's faithful. He never will leave us or forsake us. You know, other people will, and things, things you get tired of, but our God remains. Is the only thing that really remains the same, and um, and we've had a, a very fruitful life, you know, and I've had learned to learn a lot of lessons, but that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And when it comes to respecting your husband, I think sometimes when you're, especially I think a lot of times when you're not able to, you know, uh, you're in, you're in a, a place where you're financially, uh, it's difficult for you. Sometimes I think that's when a husband and wife um, can get, mad at each other, you know, and try to blame one another um, for where they're at. And I, and, I, and I think they just need to hold on to one another and, and encourage one another um, that God is faithful and, um, and, and that they ought to be doing the right things to correct if they, you know, if they're in a lot of trouble, a financial trouble, correct those things, you know. Um, but... But hold on to one another, you know, and, and especially the Lord. Allow him um, um, to minister to them, to one another, you know, to one another. At the end um, of the day, you know, at the end of the day, you just need each other. You do. 
you need each other. I, I, you know, I, I, we've seen it with uh, people who have gone gone home to be with the Lord and all. You know, their 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 last days, they're not wishing they had a better car, right? You know, nicer home. They're really not. They're not. They're not thinking those kinds of thoughts. You know, oh, I wish I'd have bought those shoes. You know, they don't think that way. Because when stripped down to just the basic, uh, here I am on a bed and I'm about to die. And I, I want to live like I'm ready to die. Mm -hmm. That's how we live. You know, I'm not going to lay on a bed in regret. I'm not. So if you put the, the Lord first and, and like Joshua says, yes, for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Well, the, what, what is better than that? Yeah, there are tears that come into my, my heart because, you know, as a man, I, I wanted to, I would like to provide for my family sometimes those material things, of course. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You know, a man who doesn't provide for his own household is worse than an infidel. But it's not just the material things, of course, it's the spiritual things. Because mm -hmm. there are a lot of infidels who provide the material things, but no spiritual. Mm -hmm. And me, I wanted to provide the spiritual things, and and God freed us up eventually to through finances and, and help. So I was able to give them other things too. But I, I never wanted to create materialist children. I wanted to, to raise children who saw the value of worshiping God. And and so God was good to me and to Marie. And, and we learned to communicate. We learned to share our hearts, but we also learned to communicate when it came to personal wants and material needs and that's all part of it. And then that flowed into just our love life, you know, that that the courtesies and concerns that you have for that woman whom you love and and all it just flowed into that so that the Lord has blessed us. I, I would say, you know, especially by now with a, 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 a deeper appreciation of the person I'm with, you know, and the value of that person as a person. I got upset at Marie one day many years ago now, and I, not like I never got upset again after that, <laughs> but I was real oh. upset. And I, and I, and we were young married at the time, and, and I was direct. I'm a very direct person. I had to learn to couch my words with gentleness because I didn't know how to do that. And it's my fault. I just never thought about it or learned to do that, whatever. But I was very direct, and she teared up, and she was hurt by my words. There's one who speaks... His words are like the piercing of a sword, you know, and and I pierced her little soul, and and I, I sensed an impression of the spirit of the Lord. I've never forgotten where the Lord said, "Do not speak to her that way. She's my little girl." I've never forgotten that. Don't speak to her that way. She's my little girl, and 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 I'm not kidding. I I mean I'm really not. I I didn't imagine that. I I sensed that. It was a very direct rebuke from God himself in my heart. And he said, don't speak to her that way. She's my little girl. And it hit me. She's, she is. Why am I treating her as if she's not? Why am I disrespect? Those are the things that you learn over time when you, when you want to please God. Those are the things you learn, you know. And I'm not saying everybody's going to hear this internal voice. I'm not saying that. Of course, I think there have been unique instances in my life that, that, that are not for every person, but they have been true in, me, in my life. That was a very real moment. And I haven't forgotten it. It's been over 40 years, and I haven't forgotten it. Be careful how you speak to this little girl. She's God's little girl. Stuff like that. When you actually take the Bible and say, hmm, this applies you know, love one another, respect one another, honor one another, all of those one another's. And you apply that and you say, this, this is God's daughter. You know, she may be my wife, but she's God's daughter. You change the way you, you speak. You, you change the way you treat her. You honor her and you respect her and you, you cherish her. You, why? She belongs to God. It, that, that changed my life. It really did. That's amazing. Well, and, and also, uh, a wife ought to be careful how she speaks of her husband, you know? I, I don't believe that a wife should go around telling people all sorts of bad things about their husband. It makes him look 
bad and as well as her. And I, I think women have to be careful of that. If they need to confide, go to a, their pastor or their counselor and talk to them, you know, and um, with, you know, get some help in your marriage. But don't, don't, don't go around um, saying how bad your husband is to everybody. You know, it really makes you look good, bad, not look good. Um, and, uh, and your husband is as well. And, you know, you might have issues with your own self, you know, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, he can, he can come and say, well, you, you haven't done this, that, and the other either. So we have to be careful. Women need to hold their tongues, know when to hold their tongues. They really do. And, um, and get counsel if they're having a problem in their marriage with one another. It, and uh, yeah, we've done pretty good about that. <laughs> we did, We're we've done, we've done, we've done, still and God has been gracious, you know, mm -hmm. God has been gracious. I, I have to tell you, I never heard my mom disrespect my father, ever, ever. And that's, that's always uh, something I could always say. My mom was, has always been, you know, uh, behind her husband and and uh, very respectful to my father and my fa and I never heard my father either my children can say that about their mother that's that's a fact Marie does not disrespect me and they've never seen her do that she never has she doesn't she, she did one time and she didn't know that she did but I explained <laughs> to her that she did <laughs> and that was the only time and that was once again early in our marriage Maybe with it, while she was pregnant with Corinne, so yes. it was early in our marriage, and it was a minor thing that I didn't appreciate and she didn't realize. Mm -hmm. But your mom picked up on it, though. I remember that. Oh yeah, that. that's right. Yeah, that's because I oh, looked at my right. mother-in-law. So Marie had said something silly, and I looked so at my mother-in-law, and my mother-in-law looked back at me like she just stepped in a landmine, didn't she? I mean, she gave me that look, and <laughs> I still right. remember looking at my mother-in-law. Like, uh oh, I'm and in trouble. I, and I turned to, turned to Marie, and I said, Marie, it's time for us to go. And I looked at her mother, and I <laughs> nodded goodbye, Mrs. Lopez. And she was looking at her daughter like she's going out to get slaughtered right now. <laughs> and That's we went to the I car, and I said, that. don't ever speak to me like that again. Yeah. Don't ever say something like that again. Yeah. That's I true. said, I'm not, your, I'm not your joke. I'm your husband. Yes. yes. And she, she never has since then. Yeah. Yeah. I take those things real seriously. Yeah. She knows that. Yeah. She didn't mean it. No, I, I didn't. didn't it was, it. I was very it was foolish. Silly. It was stupid it was silly. and foolish. You but know, you didn't but, do that. But, uh... but it's those things that you've learned over the years. Mm -hmm. Oh, she did, and we did. Oh, I yes. did. We learned. You, and that's what marriage is, right? You learn. Do you want to stay married? You learn. You learn yeah, each other. That's true. You learn each yeah. other. Each other's language. I mean, you mm -hmm. learn. You learn what they like and what they don't like. That's, you know, and. And what a wife is supposed to be. We, we learn, you know, it's, it's, it's been good. Well, you guys, thank you so much. That, that was a good conversation. And it does tie back again to communication because it's part of it mm -hmm. in our growth in Christ and in, with one another. And it's important that as husband and wives that we all stay in the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us mm -hmm. and to deny ourselves and to learn one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you guys, thank you so much. I really appreciated this, and I had a good time. Awesome. Uh, it was fun. And church family, I hope you guys enjoy this, and we do look forward uh, to meeting again. And Pastor, are there a few last words you'd like to say? I just said I love, I love my people. I love our church. I miss you. Mm -hmm. And looking forward to getting together again real soon. Mm -hmm. But until then, keep watching us. <laughs> yes. Love you. Love, love you. you. God bless you. <laughs>